Okay, and we are live and ready to go. Welcome back, everyone. Um, going to have a lot of fun tonight. Um, so over the weekend, I was having um, a bit of fun playing around with a few other projects, and so I was kind of hoping to spend a little time at the beginning um, just kind of walking through um, some of the stuff that was getting me excited um, and then a few updates. So I'm going to dive right into things. So first thing is Hacktoberfest is coming up. Um, for those of you uh, who are unfamiliar with it, um, Hacktoberfest is sort of a um, large um, hackathon-ish um, where throughout the month of October, um, if you contribute to open source projects, um, specifically ones where you've got issues labeled with the Hacktoberfest uh, label, um, I think it's five pull requests if you get those accepted, um, you end up getting the, the cool Hacktoberfest shirt. It's really just a great way of, if you're looking for um, opportunities to, to contribute to a project, um, typically the issues that are labeled for Hacktoberfest are designed for um, uh, new people to try to uh, you know, get your feet wet and get familiar with the process of creating a pull request and working through um, everything that goes along with that. Um, and so uh, several of my libraries are going to be um, involved in that. Uh, material design in XAML, um, you can expect to see uh, me going through a lot of the issues and labeling them. Um, part of the criteria for labeling an issue with Hacktoberfest um, is very similar to the criteria for like good first issue um, is you try to keep the scope um, very well defined so that it's very obvious when it's completed um, you, you're not going to find a lot of issues that are you know kind of ambiguous or at least hopefully you don't find too many issues um, but there's uh, if, if you're interested in getting more information the um, Hacktoberfest is sponsored by a company called DigitalOcean there's the link in the chat as well um, and you can sign up to get more information there as well um, to know when the project is going to kick off um, and all of that information. So 14 days until October and Hacktoberfest starts. So for everybody who's interested in getting a free t-shirt and getting involved in open source I would very much encourage you um, to check it out um, especially if you're contributing to open source anyway you might as well get a t-shirt out of it. So. Uh, if anyone runs into problems or has questions about it or um, is struggling to get pull requests or find issues, please let me know. I'm always happy to help um, get people off and running, um, especially if you're, if you're willing to learn and you want to you wanna get it in, let me know. So, Okay, moving right along. Um, so over the weekend, I started um, playing around with porting uh, one of my libraries um, over to Azure DevOps. Now, it previously it had been on AppVair, um, and I will say this, AppVair is wonderful. If you've got an open source project and you want a really quick uh, build system set up, ready to go, AppVair is great. Um, the one thing that it doesn't have is um, a lot of kind of pre-built configurations, um, and specifically when we get to the release pipelines in Azure DevOps is there's not a really good um, correlation over an AppVair. AppVair is really good at running your scripts, doing builds, publishing out NuGet packages, it does all of that well, but everything's kind of confined to a single um, pipeline. And so if you want uh, more control than that, and you want to distribute things out, um, I'm going to walk you through what I, I, I think I finally settled on what I like for how I'm going to be setting up most of my pipelines. Um, and so I was going to share that with you guys. Now the material design in XAML library isn't quite following this pattern. So just be aware what I'm about to show you is um, being used on a different project other than that. So for those people who are interested, there is the, the project in question. It's called AutoDI. Um, it's my own dependency injection library. Um, but the, the actual library really doesn't matter that much for what we're going to be discussing here. This is really about if you've got a library that you want to um, distribute specifically as a NuGet package, this is how um, I've gone through and set up my stuff and what I think is pretty close to optimal. So um, the key things to know about the project is there is a single solution file. Um, inside of the solution file there is multiple project files and several of those project files um, end up generating NuGet packages. So um, even if you just have a single project that's generated a single NuGet package, this still applies. But just be aware that this also scales out um, at least fairly well. I think I'm distributing four NuGets out of this. One, two, three, 
four. I think there's just four. Um, I've got a fifth one in the works. Um, but this does scale out. So the first thing that you're going to do is um, go into Azure DevOps and create yourself a new project. So these projects, to use Azure DevOps, you don't have to take everything wholesale. So for example, when you first create a brand new project, they've got um, issue boards if you want to do your issue management through there. They've got repos if you want Azure DevOps to host your Git repo. Great. Um, the ones I'm interested in are just pipelines and artifacts because for this project, my, my repo lives on GitHub. I'm happy with it there. I've got no reason to change. That's where open source projects tend to live mostly, so I'm perfectly happy staying there. But what I really want is a better CI system where I can easily publish out preview NuGet packages and then when I'm ready I want to just click one button and have a full NuGet package going out. Now with AppVar you end up doing some some funky things with either variables or special branches or tagging and that kind of thing to try and differentiate okay what is a preview build what is a release build and you end up um, in a lot of cases recompiling your code even if it's against the same commit you still end up doing that second compile and that's that's always left me a little bit of a weird feeling is I would prefer if the the same DLL that I test against on my preview build if I say yes this is good it's going out the door I want those exact bits to be the thing that goes out the door so that's what I've got set up here so you'll notice you can go through and I just ticked off all of the boxes of the stuff that I didn't want I didn't care about the test plans or the repos or the boards all I care about are pipelines and artifacts so we'll start with the pipelines. So underneath Azure DevOps, there's two kind of broad categories of pipelines. You've got build pipelines, which are usually responsible for creating some sort of, um, I don't want to use the word artifact, some sort of result, whether that be you know DLLs, NuGet packages, compiled EXEs, et cetera, et cetera. Build pipelines usually produce something. Whereas release pipelines are all about taking some result and distributing it. So in our case, it's going to be distributing out um, to various NuGet channels. So let's take a look at what this is. So on my, on my build pipeline, um, one of the other fundamental differences is build pipelines. Um, uh, I personally like doing the ones that are YAML files checked into my repository, which means that as my code evolves, that build um, YAML script file will evolve with it. So it means that if this pipeline were to run from two different branches, in this case, I've got a master branch trigger set, but in theory I could have different versions of my YAML files doing slightly different things. Whereas a release pipeline generally lives outside of your repo um, because again it's all about distributing. Okay, so down in here, um, the, the, the key parts for this when you go through and create a brand new pipeline is um, these steps. This is basically what do I need to do to produce my output. right? So um, the key things here, um, I found that I, I typically am wanting the latest version of the NuGet EXE. And so they've got a pre-built task right here that's just NuGet installer. So when you get this um, initial steps thing, I think there's a, a default like script step that says hello world when it comes in. But the key thing that you want to do is save your Azure Pipelines YAML as soon as you get a blank one. And then this wonderful little task list shows up over here on the right hand side. right? So we can then go through and do something like uh, NuGet tool installer and you, and this one doesn't really have a lot of settings for it. We could tell exactly which version, but not, in my case, I just want to always grab the latest. And I say add, poof, and it dumps something in right over here for me. And I don't care about a version spec because it's empty anyway, so I'm going to delete it. And you'll notice this actually matches exactly what I had down here. Um, and if you ever have something that's already in here and you want to go through and edit, this fancy new little settings link, if you click it, and actually let's pick on something that actually has settings. It'll actually pre-populate it over here so that you can edit them up in that same GUI and put it back over. Because anybody who's ever worked with YAML, um, I, I tend to hate that it's so uh, picky about white space. So it can be a little obnoxious to uh, work with in that regard, but this GUI means that you don't have to think about it as much. You can just hit the drop downs. You don't have to guess at what um, variables are here and what options are available to you. It's all usually just right here in front of you. So step one, grab the latest version of NuGet EXE. Uh, step two, restore all of the NuGet packages that I depend on. Um, it's worth knowing I uh, 
this guy here, you just point it at the solution that you want, tell it to restore, it pulls down all of my NuGet packages. Um, I think I might be able to start getting away from this. Um, I believe if you have everything being compiled with the .NET Core and you do .NET build, um, you can get the NuGet restore working. This isn't completely true for my solution. So these two steps you may not need, but for the older like CS projects, like current WPF apps, this is the kind of pattern that you're going to end up looking to use, where it's download my NuGet.exe um, and then call restore. Now there is, you don't necessarily need this NuGet tool installer. Um, there is a version of NuGet that's in the build agents, but it's a little bit older. Um, and I'm trying to remember. For some reason, I needed the latest one to be able to grab it. Uh, next one down is we actually just need to compile our code. So in this case, um, again, if you were looking for it, there's um, it can be a little bit confusing. But if you do something like build, um, there are a lot of different ways of actually compiling your code. So there's if you're doing .NET Core projects and you just want the .NET CLI, you've got your .NET Core option here. Um, there's an MS Build option um, if you're actually relying on MS Build to do your compilation. But the one that you typically want to uh, work with is the Visual Studio Build, um, especially if you're using Visual Studio uh, to compile your app locally. This will give you a cloud version that's a lot uh, closer for it. So there is a lot of overlap though between this one and the MS build option. As you can see, there's even like just raw MS build arguments to pass through. So be aware of that. Um, next up is actually running all your unit tests. You do have unit tests, obviously. Um, and so just going through the, again, if we do test, um, we've got a bunch of different options, but again, the Visual Studio test is typically the um, companion to the Visual Studio build option. Um, for those people who uh, watched my stream before and we were looking at App Center, you'll notice there's options for App Center distribution and test here. So um, that test section in App Center that's a little obnoxious to push things to, you can script it right here with this guy. Uh, next one, this one's a little bit more specific to me um, because this is actually going through um, all of the NuGet packages out of this repository uh, as the versions update. That I have um, dependencies that basically are locked to s specific versions. So if you take the, uh, the AutoDI build NuGet package, for example, you have to take that exact version of the AutoDI base library. There's some tight coupling between these libraries where you are forced to have exact versions. And so this PowerShell script just goes through and updates my new specs for that. Again, this library is a little bit unique in that the NuGet packages um, that it generates are a little more complex than just straight um, .NET pack type stuff uh, only because uh, it's it's creating MS build tasks to modify the build pipeline in addition to just referenced assemblies so it gets a little fancy um, and then finally calling NuGet pack um, if you have a simple library um, rather than doing the NuGet pack command you could just go with this .NET core option and rather than build you could do .NET pack and just point it at that and generate out your NuGet packages that way. The key part is you just need to generate um, some result from this. And again, you'll notice on this build pipeline, the uh, hey, Exotic Funk, welcome back. It's going good. Uh, just looking at Azure pipelines. Um, so the, the key thing for this build pipeline is it, its output is going to be a NuGet package. So uh, it's going to generate out several of these NuGet packages. So base library, build, ASP.NET Core, generator. Um, and then for anybody doing symbol packages, uh, this is the latest stuff for um, NuGet.org. Um, if you try to do the old symbol packages, you will get rejected as I discovered over the weekend. So that was fun. Uh, let's see. And so in this case, uh, I'm pushing the, these NuGet packages into their own folders. This isn't strictly necessary. This was just for my own sanity to be able to keep stuff uh, organized. Ooh, cool. What's the project, Exotic Funk? Uh, and then finally, the last thing you have to do is actually publish your results. So at the end of your build pipeline, you either need to copy in um, your information into this build artifact staging folder so this is just a variable you can copy stuff into, or you can use the publish build artifacts task um, to basically get everything in there. So 
this is just pushing all of this through. If we jump over here, so this, if we go and look at one of my successful builds, not one of my failed builds, um, you'll note that underneath my artifacts, I now have all of these items that if I wanted to go through and download them, you just click on one and it pops open and you can see everything that's inside of it. In this case, it's just a NuGet package. Again, I, you didn't have to organize them into individual folders. You could have just dumped them all together, but I like to separate my stuff out just for, um, it makes me feel organized, even though I may not be. So that's build pipelines, and they're, they're fairly easy to set up. They, the, for anyone who's worked with um, AppVare, um, their stuff is a little bit more next, next finish, and you're off to the races. Um, DevOps, there's a little more configuration. It, it, it's not too terrible as long as you understand what you're doing, but there's a, a lot more uh, knobs to turn and widgets to frob. So, But that gets us um, from the, the build pipeline all the way to the release pipeline. So on the uh, release pipeline, um, again, the, the point of a release pipeline is to take some, some result and distribute it out somewhere. So in this case, we've generated up um, four NuGet packages, and we're now going to distribute them to different places. So we've got NuGet.org, um, both as a pre-release and a final release NuGet package. Um, and then Azure DevOps actually supports adding um, your own NuGet package stream here. So I've got a, um, a CI NuGet package stream that's right here so that as things distribute I can just publish them here and have access to them. And as uh, there's a new feature that's in preview right now for public feeds. Um, private feeds have been around for a little bit but now you can turn these guys public and let other people connect to them. It is worth knowing there's a the link up here will take you over to some documentation for the project settings. Um, you do have to turn on um, public access um, for your project in order to be able to, to get the public feeds to, to light up for you. So, but that's, that's ultimately where these guys are going. So how do we set up a release pipeline? Let's look. So release pipelines are a little bit more um, GUI intensive rather than um, YAML based. So. On the left-hand side, underneath the artifacts section, you have um, the inputs for your for your pipeline. Cool exotic funk. I'll take a look at it in just a second. Um, so in this case, the the input for this release pipeline is going to be the result of the auto DI artifacts. So every time there's a build, this guy comes out, um, and you'll notice that it does have a um, continuous deployment trigger. Uh, every time something goes to the master branch. So every time something merges in, this guy does a build. If the build succeeded, it comes over and creates a release, and the release then starts walking down this path. So in this case, this guy comes through with um, four separate artifacts, one, of the, one for each of those uh, NuGet packages that we published. Um, and so this first step is a single job with a single task. It does NuGet.push, it grabs everything in my auto DI artifacts and pushes it up to that artifacts um, CI feed. And I'm done. And that's all it takes to, to push it out. So it's worth noting though that those um, NuGet packages that went through there um, have the dash CI on the end, which means uh, NuGet treats them as a preview NuGet package, which for at least this first step, that's great. That's all we're looking for. Um, it's worth noting here the reason that it was autodi.artifacts is because I gave it an alias. Um, the same thing for nuget.org. Um, this guy here um, is set up with a little bit of a delay. So if you click on the preconditions, um, you'll notice it has a schedule that it actually goes through and triggers and pushes out at. So 3 a.m. Oh, universal coordinating time. That's not right. I'm in the Pacific time zone. Let's go with that. That makes a little more sense. And then it also has, um, so it's got a, a deployment trigger of kicking off nightly, basically, is what it's doing, so once a day. So if there was something that came through during the day, this guy will kick off every night. 
And then on the deployment queue, I always set it to deploy latest and cancel the others so that if I get a backlog of things built up, it only takes the latest one. I don't care about um, distributing everything in order, but deploy in sequence is the default. So there's that. I'm just going to save that guy real quick. Great. And then finally, the last one, the nougat.org actual release. Man, and, I, and I'm just noticing I cannot type today. So nougat.org is spelled with an O last time I checked. Not a P. I really should have checked my stuff. Um, so, but this is what usually where people run into problems of why the, the build pipeline doesn't make NuGet packages. Is now we have this issue of I've got a NuGet package that already has the the dash CI build number as part of it. So NuGet's going to register it as a pre-release NuGet package. And then um, we need to actually change it over to a full release. So there is a wonderful tool uh, called NuGet Package Wrench. It's a .NET CLI global tool. You can download and install it, and it's got a built-in command, um, among other things. There's a lot of cool features that it's got built into it. Um, basically, everything that you would want to do to manipulate your NuGet packages. It's wonderful. Um, but it's got a simple command that says, hey, take all of my NuGet packages and flip them over to release. So all it does is go through those NuGet packages, look at the version, and trim off the dash whatever you've got on to the end of it, making it a effectively a release NuGet package. So I haven't changed any of my binaries. All I've done is flip that version in my NuGet manifest, which is great. And then NuGet push, it's the same type of thing. I'm pointing at NuGet.org. Um, it is worth knowing you do have to set up a service connection out to it. Um, and away you go. And so this basic pattern of having a an artifacts target that deploys continuously as things come through so that I, if I want to test my packages as I build them they're ready to go. Um, a nightly release to NuGet um, just so that if I find a bug here in my local testing I can um, either cancel or fix it before it actually gets around to NuGet because I'm not awake at 3 a.m. I hope. Um, and then finally this NuGet.org release. This one has one last um, precondition on it in that somebody has to go through and actually hit an approve button. So I don't want a release to go out the door until I hit it um, and I've got it set to time out for 30 days because if a release has been sitting here waiting to go and I haven't hit approve for 30 days I probably don't care about it. So those are build and release pipelines and that's how I'm planning on structuring most of my open source projects. So if anyone has uh, questions or interest in this um, I've really been enjoying working with the Azure pipelines and again you don't have to use um, all of Azure DevOps uh, if you don't want it. If you have your stuff on GitHub, great. And the best part, if you make this a, a public repo, um, everything is free. Um, you can do private repos. There's some minor limitations like you only get, what is it? It's several, I, I believe it's several hundred build minutes um, for private repos. It's very, very generous. Um, and I've never come close to hitting it even with several private repos that I run um, but for this one again it's all public which is even better okay now deviating let's take a look at this link real quick ooh exotic funk I might need a slightly different link uh, duh, duh, duh. it looks like I would have to be a member of what I suspect to be some discord channel in order to get access to it. So I'll circle back around if you've got another uh, link or uh, information to look at. Okay. With that said, I think I'm finally caught up. Uh, material design and XAML. Back to my old friend. So uh, the 3.0 release, I'm slowly having things pile up a little bit. Um, I have gone through, I've tried to tag some things for good first issue. Um, I, given that we're quickly approaching the end of the month, I suspect not all of these changes are going to get in, and so I might end up punting some of these. Um, but I do want to try and get at least like all of the breaking changes stuff in and taken care of. Um, there was the the issue from last week with the styling resource dictionaries. Those are in and merged, so if you have a chance to test them out um, and let me know if there are any problems that you encounter, um, I think most of that is 
um, fixed and I need to take the tag off of this one this is no longer details needed uh, and this is assuredly a bug so a couple issues I was planning on looking at tonight so one this pack icon one um, is interesting to me so this one was first brought to my attention um, by somebody who was doing WPF in PowerShell um, and it it actually ended up it, it took me a while to track it down um, but it turned out that the the problem that we were hitting was an issue with the pack icon um, and it usually crops up when using the Visual Studio Designer uh, the Visual Studio Designer is not tolerant of classes that derive from a generic class which is weird because this is this is now closed over this generic type it shouldn't be a problem I understand uh, in WPF uh, we've got the older XAML specs so we don't get generics but we're closed over the generic it shouldn't be a problem but for whatever reason um, it still chokes and it chokes in both the WPF designer as well as in PowerShell so I swapped this guy out um, because ultimately the only reason that th that we're deriving from this is because of a, a third-party library um, called controls EX that we were deriving from this is a shared library between a few projects um, the other more notorious one is my apps um, and this is the way like the my apps icon pack the way all of their stuff is set up um, however in their case they've got multiple enum values uh, they're doing a lot more with it um, and I want to give a shot or um, take away the generic base class just derived from control directly there's only um, basically one property on here kind that matters and data when I said one I meant two um, but all this does is take this enum value and go and look up the appropriate um, path geometry for the pack icon um, if to, to to pull it out and that dictionary is, is built up um, currently by another Azure pipeline that I have it just pulls down all of the latest material design in XAML um, or material design icons library it just downloads all of those and um, automatically merges in so if you ever see an icon on the website that you don't see in our library check because I've got a nightly um, build process that should be pulling in all the latest stuff every night so hopefully it's all there and we don't lag behind more than a day or two so um, there is all of that so this is the change but I've been a little hesitant to merge it in one because this is definitely a breaking change because I'm I'm taking out a class and going to a just the standard WPF control based class um, and so definitely a breaking change and two I'm not hundred percent confident that it actually fixes the problem so what I was wanting to lead with is actually writing a unit test to, to a reproduce the problem um, because currently the only way I've been able to reproduce this is inside of PowerShell but I believe if we go through and just use the XAML reader we can probably reproduce it so that is the hope I was gonna start there with the unit test and verify that I can make it fail um, and if we can make it fail then we'll merge this in and verify that it fixes it And if that's the case then yeah we'll go for it because then I've at least got uh, good reproduction all the way through so that's where I was going to lead because I know that this is actually breaking at least one person um, and I'm kind of hoping it'll start to cut down on some of our Visual Studio Designer issues that have plagued this library for a while. So that's where I'm leading or where I'm headed. So again, if, if anyone has questions, I'm always happy to deviate. Exotic Funk, sorry I wasn't able to open that link. So if you've got better information or a, a different place for me to look, let me know and I'm I'm happy to check it out uh, okay so here we go do, do, do. Uh, let's go test and I don't think we do have a pack icon test wonderful great this bug here was actually one that was caused by my pipeline um, let's see here so I think STA fact let's bring that in description and I usually try it to include my my issue numbers and I think there wasn't an issue 
uh, this one. I think this is it. 1340? Let's just verify that this is the case. Uh, yeah, so another case where it was being pulled in and loaded externally. Uh, great. So let's good enough number to work with. So issue 1340 at least gets at least it would get somebody to the to an issue with links to other stuff. Public void pack icon can be loaded from XAML reader. So let's see, string XAML gets ba -ba -ba. trying to decide how, how deep I need to nest this. Because we probably so let's just come back to come back to you in a minute. So let's see. I'm trying to remember the exact syntax for this. Uh, system Windows Markup. So I'll just, that guy, I believe, is the one I want. Uh, XAML load stream parse. Parse is what we want. XAML. Uh, and so then the question is, what what are we going to have this guy return? I think I probably want to go with something really, really simple. Let's go up here. Yeah, let's just create. I, I think let's just create a basic user control, dump it in there, um, and then we'll just um, copy the XAML out of that, and away we go. So let's do this. So yeah, sure, we're just going to delete this when we're done, so I don't care what it is. User control 1 sounds great. I should go back and see if I can actually find that original PowerShell project, because if this works, I'm going to be, it's going to be a little unfortunate, because I, I really need this to fail first. So let's see here, uh, let's see, user control, and I think all I, all I have to do is something like uh, pack icon kind gets face. Let's see, go ahead and import that. Yep, that'd be great. Thank you very much. Don't need that include. Uh, well, yes, I do need that include. Shepard, you're lying to me. Okay, great. We're just going to grab this whole bit of XAML, and come back over here, and because this is a string literal, we can do multi-line. Oh, but we're going to get hit by that. Okay, uh, open VS Code, please. One of the things that I very much enjoy doing is using VS Code for my string replacements. So I'm starting to think I might have a few too many, few too many uh, extensions loaded. Okay, so find all my quotes, replace them all with double quotes. Uh, great, do it. And paste. Something like that. I think just for symmetry, I'm going to move that guy to the end. So this guy should then be cast to a user control. Uh, yep, that guy there. This becomes a user. Well, heck, we can use var right there. Um, do, do, do. So this guy becomes a user control. Great, great, great. Wonder if he's going to squawk about the X class. We might have to end up dropping that. Um, do, do, do. Brings this in. We 
can drop the design. Oh, let's leave the designer elements in there. Uh, so let's see. User control. So assert not null on user control. Assert not null on user control dot content as pack icon. That should work, right? Run my unit test. Um, for anybody who hasn't noticed, this is the new um, test runner. Uh, it's fairly new to Visual Studio 2019. I'm trying to remember exactly. I think it was one or two updates ago that they dropped it in, but it's been fairly nice to work with. Um, anybody who's used any of the third-party runners this finally brings it up to the feature parity. Um, they've got the live unit testing stuff all built in. Everything just kind of runs really smoothly. Come on. Come on. I know. you got to recompile the universe. Uh, oh, I wonder if this is going to run it in both targets. Because we target both uh, .NET 4.5 and .NET Core app. Uh, da, da, da. Wonder if this should be turned back down. It's kind of nice having the newer APIs for the test project, but I'd hate to accidentally um, miss something because we're running with it. I, yeah, it's probably not a big deal. Probably not a big deal. Come on. I will say I'm very much looking forward to the .NET Core 3 uh, being released in a little bit. It is going to make um, many of my projects much simpler. Um, if nothing else, just being able to convert all of my CS projects to the new CS proj format, so much nicer, so much nicer. Even just for the simple, um, the new CS proj formats, you can double click on them and it opens them up for editing. That alone is awesome. <laughs> I, I get happy by the little things. Oh, yay. Unit test failed. Yes. That's what we wanted. I want to prove that this thing will actually... Because if this thing succeeded, that would really ruin my day. Because I expect this to fail. Specific... Uh, let's see. Specify class name. Oh. Uh, Right, okay, so it is unhappy about the X class. Okay, well it failed, but not for the reason I wanted. So, hang on, not out of the woods yet. Run it one more time. This, I, I, I wanna see it fail, but I want it to fail for the reason I expect. Because what should end up happening is, um, I want this guy to throw that same XAML parse exception like I want, I want this exception, but I want this is the wrong message that goes with it. I want it to choke on the pack icon. Um, and if this, by some miracle, passes, we might just set the height and the width um, because the areas where this guy was falling apart um, was in some of the templates where we have pack icons already set with styles on them for width and height. So I want to see if I can make this guy fail appropriately. Come on. No green lights. Cannot create unknown type. Well, that's close, but that's not quite what I expected either. Okay. You... We're, we're going to have to create a parser context, aren't we? Okay. Well, far context gets new parse context. Really want this guy to fail nicely for me. Wasn't it parse context? Am I crazy? Parser context. Okay. Poof. Okay, what do you give me? Uh, not a lot to work with. What else? 
Base URI type mapping. Uh, let's see. Because you allow me to XML. XML, not XAML. Oh boy. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Uh, yuck. Okay, so this guy is falling over. Now the question is how to how to do this. Okay, so I think I can find this one. Let me go see if I can find the original XAML that was causing this to choke because I really want to watch this thing fail for me. Um, and I believe I can find it here real quick. Um, Cause I believe it was Jerome that sent me the link. Uh, let's see if I can find his blog post. Da -da -da -da. Yeah, there's that, and then it should be, doo -doo -doo. Uh, let's see here. So I'll just bring this over here for anyone interested. So this is um, basically a similar theme manager to what you see in the demo app, um, but this is done entirely with PowerShell. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Du -du 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 -du. Find the theme, change the theme, but what I'm looking for is how this guy loaded it up. So I really don't want to have to include PowerShell with my. There. GitHub. Um, I really don't want to have my uh, unit test invoke PowerShell if I can help it. That would be fairly obnoxious. So let's go application. Uh, let's see here. Here's the XAML file. So it starts from window, pulls this guy in, make sure it's available. Um, there's some trick that I'm trying to remember here. Oh, is it making sure the assemblies are loaded? Okay, load from assemblies, let's see, uh, load XAML, or load XML. So XML document loads up the XML document, XAML reader, so this is effectively what we need to reproduce. This is slightly different than what we were doing. So XML document load, which gets me to here. So that I need an XML document to load, and then I need a node XML node reader, and then pass that into Windows Markup XAML reader. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Let's see if we can make this happen. Uh, so start there. Windows Markup XAML Reader. What are you choking on? Uh, oh. System Windows Markup XAML Reader. And then this was load. And yeah. So there's all that stuff. And let's see. This is XML document var document gets new XML document. And I am aware that there's other ways to go about doing this but I want to stick to as close to this as I can just to prove to myself that it's working. Uh, XAML loader load uh, document load XAML great that gets
gets me to there, there, there. Uh, XML node reader. So var reader gets one of those. Give me a new one, please. And you will take the document in. And this load takes in the reader. And from here, we get our user control. Something akin to that. Uh, user control. Oh. OK. Fail with the error that I expect. Fail appropriately. It would make me really happy to have a unit test that reproduces the bug. Because when possible, I do enjoy trying to write these unit tests. Because there's been a couple bugs where we've gotten plagued many times over, and this feels like the type of change that will um, bite me many versions down the road if we don't make absolutely sure I know why I'm making the change. I mean, I know that making this change fixes fixes the issue, at least as I saw it, but uh, let's see, illegal characters in path. Well, which ones and where? Uh, let's see. That confuses me. All right. Should be... Nothing fancy. So this was just pointed here, right? Uh, let's see. And this should all work. So this should be, we could switch it over to doing a window. I'm a little curious what illegal characters in path. What path? What illegal characters? XML document or XML document load string file name. Oh, because you think this is a file name? Oh yeah, that'll do it. Definitely illegal characters in that file name. Right. So you probably need something stream stream or text reader so how about I think we can do new string reader All right yeah, give me one of those guys because I believe string reader implements and then I can just give it that because he was loading from a file which meant that he would have a file stream I don't have a file stream I just have a straight string so this should get me pretty close I'm wondering if I'm supposed to be disposing of this too. Clean up for later. Clean up for later. Come on. Go, Visual Studio. Go, go, go. I believe in you. I believe in you. You can do it. I'd love to be able to turn on live unit testing while streaming. It's just my poor little machine. Every time I've tried it, it's fallen over. Okay. We're getting... Nope. Nope. Not what I wanted. Thank you. Cannot set unknown member ignorable. Okay. Well, let's take these two off because these are just designer related. Let's try this one more time. One more time. Because this should get us. Let's go look at um, Jerome's real quick. Because he doesn't have the ignorable set. He's got the standard uh, 2006 XAML uh, X, the interactivity, and then the material design. And those are the only XML namespaces just those four 
Okay, so we'll get ours down to just four. One, two, three, four. Ooh. Hmm. Probably should remove some of these. I'm also noticing that this is doing. We seal our namespace. Yeah, that's probably. That's probably not going to work. So we probably want to make sure we do this actually instead. So let's put you in place because this was generated from a project inside of um, the material design library, which is going to not be the same as one outside, which is what this is simulating. Okay, so that gets me a little closer. Uh, let's change this over here to be material design. That's fine. One, two, three. Okay. Uh, let's see. I te we technically don't need either of these. Right? Okay. Go. And I assume this should, because we've got this pack icon down here, it should force the assembly to be loaded before we get to this XML reader load. Which should be good enough because there are, are a lot of um, bugs that you'll find on the issue list where people have tried to pull in material design in XAML into like uh, AutoCAD or some other third party um, extension library and they run into the issue of they try to reference something in XAML before the assembly is loaded and so usually you see people suggesting effectively putting in a little no-op referencing some some library from it well that's really unfortunate that worked like a charm um, 40 I really wanted this thing to fail I did not get my failure as expected Come on. Please fail for me. I don't want to put in a blind fix without a way to reproduce it. I guess it should be there. Hmm. It makes me feel like uh, there's this problem in the back of my mind where I'm wondering if there's like maybe just a missing dependent assembly that modifies come on does not make me feel good this does not make me feel good I really want to make this fail. I really, 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 really want to make this fail. Okay, let's come back over here. Sample parse exception when used in element syntax, attribute syntax worked. When a menu item in the text box style where the text box was created. Okay. I do remember this setup, and I'm wondering if we need to get more elaborate. So, let's, let's get more elaborate. Text box. Um, uh, I suppose I can leave you there for now. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna start bringing this thing up to window and let's see here window resources close the window resources and let's do resource dictionary. Why am I why am I retyping? Copy and paste works great. Uh, let's see. Source dictionary. That comes in there, and then we should be able to bring in 
the styles. So specifically, there's one in particular, um, this defaults. Actually, let's just, while we're in here, let's grab, let's grab that too. But this defaults um, style dictionary is the one that I expect should bring in the failure because it replaces the default text box style with the material design and XAML style. And inside of that style, there is a context menu. And that context menu has its icon set using a pack icon. And that was what was tripping it up. That's right, I remember this now. Remember doing some thinking about this and being very, very confused. One, two, three, four. You're one too many. Okay. So you now become a window. Switch to window, please. And I should probably rename this so that it's not highly misleading. And window. Great. Come on, failure case. Come on, failure case. I really don't want you to succeed. Come on, come on, come on. Let's see a failure. Love to see a XAML parse exception. Because the other thing we might do is we might just embed um, the context menu directly in this text box to see if we can force it to occur. So I'll just go and copy that bit of XAML from the main library. Cert is not null. Uh, oh. Because that guy is... Probably got it. Come on, don't you work f perfectly for me. That would just make me very depressed. The fact that it got to this last assert and failed on the not null makes me assume that it was able to load this up just fine. Which is disappointing on a number of levels. What is different? What is different? I guess I am loading from a string, not a file. Oh. Cannot create unknown type. Bundled theme. Uh, da, da, da. That guy shouldn't be the one breaking it, though. It's interesting to me that that didn't cause breakage last time. Oh, probably because this syntax has slightly changed, hasn't it? I think it has. Uh, let's see, demo app. Demo app, show me your app.xaml. Bundled theme, primary color, secondary color. What did I do? Isn't that exactly what I did? Close that. Pack icon test. Primary color, secondary color. Am I missing something obvious? I don't think I am. What is, what is going on? What is different? Window resources. I uh, cannot create unknown type. Bundled theme. Isn't it? bundled theme. Aren't you right there? 
doesn't instill a lot of confidence in me given that this was the exact thing that we just changed last week um, so this might become a unit test for a different case but let's also real quick uh, let's see this is the demo I want to grab the theme for the text box specifically a context menu so this was what was breaking it oh I wonder if it's because the library can't currently compile because of my user control one that I left sitting here let's just turn that off that might be that might be contributing to it uh, let's see here so leave that there this here text box you my friend text box needs to have context menu oh hey right quotation marks matter come here VS code paste and do the replacement and let's fix the indenting so that it lines up nicely for me it's like I dropped a dropped an opening uh, brace there but we'll fix that here in a minute so do 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 paste that box context menu run this one more time I would not expect the color theme stuff to be what trips this up but we will slowly start working backwards until we figure this out da, da, da. Cause this guy should it's a project reference right want you to get package are you confused about none of them Visual Studio you just decided to give me the little yellow triangle for no reason okay great I'm sure there's probably something sitting in my warning somewhere that I can address but deal with you at a different point well that's thinking about what it's doing we're just gonna fix some indenting here think that and then that I think I actually need one more level of indenting. So much indentation, so much indentation. Horizontal space all over there. WPF is undeclared. Well, of course it's undeclared because it should be that, that, that. Try again. Should work. And if you don't, we have a problem. Where would you be? Because the whole point of this context menu is because when we override the style, we want to put in our own themed um, context menu. And so there's some fancy stuff that we do in the style for dealing with the standard cut, copy, paste, as well as uh, dealing with uh, spelling suggestions when available. moment because you 
you should not actually be contributing. Um, it does worry me though that it's flagging that. It makes me wonder if we've got a secondary bug somewhere. Why would you not be able to create an or why would the type be unknown I guess is the question. Makes me wonder if this guy is expected to have some sort of type resolver tied into it. Because I haven't explicitly added one. Would like to think that it would be included, but I don't know that for a fact. So, I mean, the only thing we could do is go through the assembly loading that the other, that the PowerShell was doing. I just shouldn't need to load those assemblies so makes me a little uneasy having to do it thinking a little harder than I expected dang it and we've succeeded hmm that is really 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 disappointing to me Very, very disappointing. Let's jump back here real quick and look over the PowerShell. So this is just making sure that these assemblies are loaded. I'm curious. I've been saying that I'm confident that the assemblies are loaded, but let's let's just make sure that that's the case. I'm pretty sure they should be loaded at this point. We've got references to them right there. They should be pulled in. Because when the method invokes the runtime has to make sure the types are present, so it would have had to have loaded. Yeah, because the 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 runtimes are fairly smart in that they don't load up everything when you first start. Things are del lazily loaded effectively when they're needed, um, so not everything is there at the initial get go. But when you start calling stuff with that code in it, yeah, it should be there. Okay, so let's just let's just do some quick checking here, just to make sure I'm not as crazy as I think. So, uh, interesting. I don't actually see the material design stuff loaded up yet. Maybe my initial assertion's wrong. Presentation core is loaded. Let's jump back. So presentation core, system windows interactivity. I don't know if that one actually matters because we aren't using it in our code. Uh, let's see, system. It's not there, but we aren't using it in our XAML, so I don't know if it matters. Hmm. Okay, well, let's let's be a little more abusive and just force load that guy so assemblies load from and this is loading from a particular DLL so we gotta effectively do something like that so do, do, do. assembly from uh, let's do type of pack icon uh, let's see assembly code base I do wonder if 
very fact of doing it like that, if that's going to actually... I want to ch check this. I, I have a feeling by doing the type of pack icon, that will actually force the assembly load. So I'm not sure that this will actually get me the desired result because before it was loading it in by DLL, which maybe that's the key difference is I need these things to not have type references. Hmm. I might need to spin these in separate app domains. That will be interesting. Debug Windows Modules. Okay, so let's see what's there. Okay, where are my modules? Modules, modules, modules. Could have sworn I just asked for them. Modules. Thank you. Yeah, so you'll notice this now has symbols loaded, even before we've executed that line. So merely by the fact of knowing that it needed to execute that line was enough to kick it into gear. Now I'm curious what happens if this this actually works or if this now falls over. Seeing it loaded up just fine. It got the text box and was able to parse it. See, I'm wondering if that's the kicker, is if I need to load this guy from the DLL with no references. Uh, just in the interest of testing this theory, um, we're going to fire this guy up real quick and I want to test, I'm just going to hard code in the path to the DLL and we're going to see what happens. Uh, let's see here, so bin debug, uh, we're running in net 4.5, yeah, so just hard code that path in there. There, material design, colors, okay, so that goes there, that goes like that, okay. And then I want to test this one more time and verify that at this point, before we execute, that the assemblies are not there. Then it loads them up. Because there is an interesting thing that happens when you do the assembly load from. And I'll have to look. Um, there's different load contexts in how an assembly is brought in. And I, I always have to look up the docs to remember which one's which. But I think assembly load from it's one of the, it's the weird one where it loads into like a none context. I think. Again, can't remember for sure. But we will check and find out. Assembly loading and assembly binding issues are one of the most painful things in the world to track down. Go away. Thanks. Okay, so debug, windows, modules. So if I sort by name, I don't have it loaded yet. Okay. Step. Step. Okay. So now if we check modules, I've got both of these loaded. Okay. Feel good. Step over. Step 
over, step over. Come on. Throw. Throw. You are not wanting to throw for me. That is really, really, really disappointing. I wish there was a way I could get this thing to reproduce nicely for me. I just don't know how to do it. I mean, we could shell out to PowerShell. Yuck. Just doesn't make me feel good. The other thing is this. I don't think this should make a difference in how this thing loads. Um, is we could load this from a file rather than from a stream, but I have a feeling that there's not that big of a difference. We're just going to look real quick and how it handles the difference between a file stream and a reader. I assume it just wraps one in the other, and away you go. But we're going to look real quick. XML document is an older class. Typically when working with XML you'd use an X document instead because it's got all of the the link friendly stuff. So if you pass in a file name versus passing in a text reader, it wraps it in as XML text reader and calls setup reader on it. Okay, so what's the difference in these constructors? Do you do anything at all fancy? So XML text reader versus text reader. So once again, it literally just shells out to another implementation. Great. I'm assuming this is some internal class. Give it its name. Come on. Go ahead and decompile. I just want I just want to look and see what it's doing. Pretty please. You can do it, ReSharper. You can do it. You know, it's, you're probably debugging or uh, decompiling the entire XML assembly at this point. Okay, so uh, temp resolver, null URL, resolve URL, blah 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 blah. Okay, where is the overload that takes in the text reader? stream text reader so this calls new on XML net reader input so it is a slightly different code path it is interesting Maybe we should write this to a file and read it in. Let's try it. Let's try it. Everything else is working for me. So rather than this, uh, let's see here. Uh, path get uh, temp file name. Great. File. Oh, wait. We're going to need. Wait, does file? write all text is void returning so string file path great sounds wonderful uh, let's see temp file name uh, returns the full path of the file great file write all text uh, to file path uh, give it XAML and then this guy becomes I'm going to keep this around for just a minute file path okay and really 
we should be cleaning up after ourselves and not just you know creating these temp files all over the place but yeah it's my temp directory I clear it out habitually anyway I'm gonna give this a shot I think the unfortunate part is most of these issues that are kind of hanging around um, are either low priority or really complex so it feels like it's a little more slogging at this point working through some of these but do want to try and resolve them. Well, that's unfortunate. So it seems to have identical behavior, or at least no discernible difference. I'm wondering, take a crack with this now that we've got um, oh my uncomment keyboard shortcut doesn't work when you're inside of a string literal. Um, I have a hunch what's wrong with this um, and I want to just make sure of design no it is in the right spot well let's try it like this now that we've got let's do this take this one instead comment this now that we're explicitly loading the assemblies that way let's try this because this should be on par with what the other ones were doing. Now I'm curious, because there were five over here that were getting loaded. What were those five? Am I missing anything? So in our activity, one, two, three, four. So this was the only additional one. Interesting, but I don't think it was being used anywhere, was it? This one, oh, it is being pulled in there. If that's contributing to it, uh, work like a charm. So now that I've got both of those DLLs loaded, it's able to pull those things up just fine. And I, I suspect the reason it was failing before is because um, these enums are declared inside of the colors library, not just the default material design themes. Hmm. I'm sort of curious what happens if we do this, right? So let's do this, this, and this. Copy, paste, and then do something like content cut there, right? There, there's no reason why this should fail. Like this should work just fine. There's no functional difference between, um, or I should say, there should be no functional difference between attribute syntax and element syntax. This is going to really bother me. fact that I can't reasonably reproduce this in a unit test is also a bit flustering. Come on, somebody fall over. Don't work. You're working and that makes me feel bad. So content cut, that is 
is not failing. So what would potentially be different? It could... Well, let's start with this. Um, so give me a PowerShell window real quick, would you? Thanks. Uh, CD dev okay, dir temp. Great. Uh, give me a VS Code instance, please. And I think we're going to just try this in here and see if we can. I'd like to get this to recreate locally for me. Uh, let's see. So, new file window, not with caps lock. Window.xaml. Great. Paste. Great. Nothing fancy. Everyone's happy currently. Okay. And then we're going to jump back over to here. I'm going to steal some code real quick. So I don't want to have to rewrite most of this. So I'm just going to steal this much at least. And let's see. Oh, we'll call it window.ps1. Great paste and we're going to grab these paths here for my DLLs. So let's see, we're not going to care about our activity for the moment, but I do care about this one and I care about this one. Let's grab both of those, paste, and I got an extra quote on this side. Great. Uh, ba -ba -ba, that should be fine there. Script directory. Uh, let's see. Let's do something like form show dialog. Right? Let's see, what did he end up doing with it? Form show dialog out null. Okay. I guess show dialog does technically have a nullable Boolean return. So. Uh, let's see. Load with one argument. HTTP is unexpected token. Expected white space. None in rule element. So something's wrong here. Oh, uh, we need to. All of these double quotes need to become single quotes. Okay, boom, done. That looks better. Well, that doesn't make me feel very good. It's my text box. Oh, the whole thing's the text box. Well, that's really, really unfortunate. So this is just working without any changes made. So I can't even reproduce it in PowerShell now. What is D? 
different. We, I haven't applied the change. So I'm I'm checking my my current git status. Um, I'm on the master branch. The only changes is the test file. I'm I'm a little confused. I I would have expected it to actually fail for me, but it appears to be working flawlessly. Interesting. I really wanted this to fail somewhere. Okay, well, huh. Huh. Trying to think. Oh, let me, let's go back to my issue description because apparently I did not leave myself when used. This was when used in element syntax on a menu in the item in the text box style when the text box was created. Windows PowerShell. I suspect this is also just. Additional null check to text field assist. Did I? Oh, that's a little bit less of an issue. Um, I'm I'm really confused as to how this is as to how this is actually working. Well, I might have to punt this for now. I think whoa, I'm out of ideas for the moment, so we are going to stash these changes, and I'm going to let them simmer for a little bit until uh, can I not uh, oh, it doesn't let me rename my stash at all. So let's just pop the stash real quick. I think if I stage and type a commit. Uh, induction of icon error. And stash. Boom. There. If you type a commit, it does push it through. Okay, so I don't believe none of these stashes are necessary anymore. So I can clear out a little bit of this. Um, but I think we're going to move on to another issue uh, because I'm confused and I'd like to actually work on something to make more progress rather than having everything go poorly for me. But sometimes that's how the day goes. Okay, so this one is a really unfortunate problem. So I believe we should be able to reproduce this. Um, but I think I have to turn on, because part of the issue is I don't run with the um, XAML debugging tools turned on. And so, enable UI tools for perfect. Uh, let's see go yeah. running in full framework uh, it is worth noting for anybody um, when you're reporting bugs I need to go through and change the, the default issue template um, but it's going to become um, incredibly um, helpful if you can specify whether you're targeting full framework or net core 3 because there is a chance that there's going to be different bugs based upon which one you're using. So if you go to open an issue, if you don't mind just including that as part of the issue log, that would be great. Okay. Let's see. Don't need my module windows. Don't need pack icon tests. So this issue here has to do with the dialog host. And the, the really unfortunate part is 
I don't know exactly what the failure is being caused by. So uh, where is my, that I had it turned on. Is that not what I just checked? Uh, let's see, debugging general something. Show runtime tools and application. That's what I want. So this little guy here, if you're familiar with it, you can click this. And the unfortunate part is what's happening right now is the, and let's get the, oh, there. The live visual tree, you'll notice, gets stuck. And it doesn't actually let you select, select past the dialog host is really unfortunate and this has been an issue that we struggled with in the past and ultimately what we did is we um, changed up the way we were doing some stuff there there's sort of three issues here um, that are all kind of competing so one issue is the desire to have the let's switch over to the dialogues section um, so for example this uh, content overlay, this kind of grayed out section here. Um, the first idea is this should animate in and out as the dialogues come in and out, which is great. Um, the other um, competing thing was wanting to uh, be able to specify a custom color for this. So you'll notice this one um, has the default purple to match the theme through here, right? So we have, uh, we have that request in there as well. And then the last competing request is to have the um, the uh, element picker actually be able to pick elements inside of the dialog host rather than getting stuck at this dialog host. So those are the three three things that we would like to all work simultaneously. And it turns out getting all three of those to work is problematic. Now. Um, uh, Jasper, who reported this issue, uh, I, uh, Jasper, S, Jasper SH, um, I, I don't know if there's a different way to pronounce that, um, pointed out it, that this likely got reintroduced um, when we switched uh, the way we were specifying that. So my thought is I would love to play around a little bit with um, how we do that content overlay and see if we can make this guy play nice because ultimately when um, that content overlay is there so first first and foremost let's confirm that that content overlay is in fact the problem so dialog host and let's go down here so part content cover grid and I am in the default dialog host style. Excellent. So there's that, there's that, there's that, there's that. Those are all the animations. This is the overlay background, right? So we're going to do this. We're just going to comment out everything having to do with the content overlay. Right, we are going to have nothing set it, and I just want to confirm that when I have this guy completely gone, that the rest of that the, the little picker and the XAML tools works correctly. There's no point in fixing it until I can actually guarantee exactly what the problem is. And there was a question posted on the issue of can we unit test our way out of this problem? And I don't. So I can unit test the conditions that once we know what the fix is, I can unit test to verify um, that those conditions don't get reverted. But I can't actually write it. Let me rephrase. I don't know how to write a good test that will verify that the Visual Studio tool is working properly. So something is something is wrong. And I, because I don't fully understand the exact conditions on what's triggering um, the live XAML tool to, f to fail, I, I don't know precisely what the fix is. So that's a little bit of what this is going to be is 
a little bit of spelunking to figure out um, what what exactly is causing this failure. And my hunch is this content cover, but I don't know that for a fact. You know, I do wonder. What, what you, so hide those for a minute. Uh, could not copy. Could not copy. Oh. Uh, I probably have a PowerShell window that has loaded those DLLs up. Let's try this one more time. And the first debug would have worked because it didn't need to recompile them, and so it didn't bother to write the files, but the second one, because I made changes here, had to write the files and then was unable to copy them. That is one of the drawbacks with those PowerShell ways of loading up DLLs like that, is it does load the DLL um, into your current running session, which ends up locking it, because there is no, there's no great way in .NET to unload a DLL. Um, now with that said, um, app domains are one option. Um, there's a lot of like plugin library frameworks that hide a lot of the complexity away from you. So if you need that kind of functionality, I recommend going that route. So let's do this. Oh, I saw it flash. OK. So we are working now. OK, so the issue is definitely that content cover. Or at least the content cover is, is definitely one of the competing things. OK, so I have a couple thoughts. Because if I recall correctly, the hit test visible was part of the problem. So let's. Uh, whoop, nope. Too much control key, too much clicking. Okay, so there's that, there's that, there's that. Great. Aside from your sharper losing its mind about what's there and what's not, we're good. So I have a feeling what's happening is hit, hit test visible false. An opacity zero. I'm wondering if. Wonder if we just hide this guy. Let's give this a shot. Visibility visible. Because I believe this trigger will fire before the visual state manager starts animating. So we should still get our animations coming in. Well let's start with this, because I think again, I, I think the problem is this guy is sitting on top and isn't able to get past it. And I know Snoop sort of cheats, and I think Snoop cheats um, by doing hit testing. And I, I suspect this other one, the, the Visual Studio one, must be attempting to be more clever. And in being more clever is being more problematic. It is one of the problems with being too clever. Sometimes you clever yourself right into a, a failure. OK. So if this works, we then know that the issue is a visible element, even though not hit testable and no opacity, so things are going, th so the clicks are effectively going straight through and not visible to the user, still gets picked up by the live XAML tools. So hopefully this works. And then the other thing to test will be to verify the animations still work in coming in because toggling visibility like this is also a great way to break your animations. But I think we can get all of these together. And then this is something that we could easily um, write a unit test for. Oh, look at that. Look at that. I'm able to click through on it. There we go. So there's, there's one thing that's working. Great. OK. Dialogues, 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 dialogues. Am I blind or stupid? There we are. OK. So animation. And 
animation. Animation, animation. Ooh. Might have to change the visibility inside of the Visual State Manager. Um, I'm noticing the 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 animate out is failing, um, and I believe it's because the trigger then undoes. It goes hidden before the Visual State Manager fires. Therefore, th there's nothing um, visible to animate. So, but that that is that is fixable. That is fixable. And I think the unit test will just end up being um, verifying that the content cover is not visible um, when the dialog is hidden. I think that'll ultimately be the unit test. Um, and we probably should end up doing the same thing for the embedded um, embedded one. So we should be able to test this. Uh, let's see. Launch from router command. So this one here, so if we are correct, this one doesn't have the fix, and we can't select individual items inside. But this one over here is the normal one, I believe. Let's just check real quick. Dialog host, great, no extra styles. This one, I can select individual items on. Okay, perfect. So we at least know what's causing it and now it's just a matter of fixing it. Okay, so the trigger itself is not going to be good enough. Um, we are going to need to do animations to actually show and hide this guy. Okay, so let's let's do that. So I think let's take Uh, let's see, double animation. We don't have any that I can, the object animations I can just directly copy. No, that would be too easy. That would be too easy. So these are the transitions. I think I don't need to do the transitions, and I can just. No, I think I do need to set them in both. Okay, so what is it? Object animation using keyframes. Uh, right, something like that. So let's see, storyboard, uh, target name, part, Content cover grid, story board, target property, visibility. And then we just need to come on. Uh, what is uh, it's like object keyframe or is not helping me at all. Uh, let's see, char animation, decimal, discrete. Uh, is, is it discrete keyframes? I think it might be. Um, Cause none of these object keyframe. Uh, let's see. Uh, value hidden. Uh, key time. Zero in this case. Okay, so we're just going to steal this. Go Place this all over. This. So this guy is going to be visible. And I tend to like to put my 
animations in the order that I expect them to be done. I, I realize these things run in parallel, but it makes me feel better when I can kind of read them top to bottom. So, visible. And this one's going to end up at the end. Uh, let's see. Hidden, and then the key time on this is going to be the end of the animation. So we want it. Poof. Okay, and I think that lines up now. Okay, so we've got all of our visual transitions set from close to open. So when going from close to open, we set it visible at the beginning of the storyboard. When going from open to close, we set it to hidden at the end of the storyboard, which lines up with what we've got here. Great. On open, we set it to visible right away. On closed, we set it to hidden at the end, but the end is, is zero anyway. Okay, let's make sure this works. I think this. I think this does it. And then hopefully we get this resolved and I can feel like I was productive tonight. Because then I think we get all, all three features um, and we'll just write a, a unit test around this guy. Again, basically the unit test is just going to say um, that the content cover grid should not be visible when the dialogue is closed. Which I think is pretty simple to do. Should be pretty simple. I hope. I don't know if we actually have many tests around that yet. Um, but we do have stuff set up for testing these UI controls. Um, it is a little weird writing unit tests around stuff in the XAML. Um, but I don't mind doing it especially when we've got things like this where it's expected to get triggered. I'm not entirely sure how the Visual State Manager behaves when the control is created via, via a unit test. Uh, let's see. Object animation using keyframes. Blah, blah, blah. Cannot animate property visibility. Uh, see details. Uh, which is not a valid... What? Oh, is it treating it as a string? Okay, well that's that's mildly obnoxious if that's the case, but we can switch this. Uh, so let's let's change this up um, because this is an object; it probably doesn't know what it needs to be. So visibility is the enum hidden. So let's just be overly verbose and specific about what we need. So closed and we will change this guy over to boom, paste uh, too many well let's fix this first visible and then I've got too many a u followed by too many a u okay nest it and then write the whole line paste there we go and then same thing up here to nested paste and visible okay this should just work I hope. I'm trying to think. I, I, I normally don't use these object animators animation using keyframes. Usually you're always animating something like uh, a relative position or an opacity because most of the time your animations are movements or rotations or fades. This kind of setting of properties is a little more unusual. 
way to make it just work. We could probably set it up. Let's say the other thing we could do is rather than doing it inside of the style triggers, we could probably set up um, just uh, either a, a binding or a trigger right on the grid itself so that when the opacity hits zero, it toggles its visibility state. That might be even cleaner. Uh, well, first of all, let's make sure we still work. Yeah, we're working. Great. Little red triangles everywhere. Okay, so dialogues. Let's verify we get animations. So you go away for the moment. Animates in. Animates out. Animates in. Animates out. Sweet. Trying to decide if I spend any time going through and writing that trigger or not. Uh, regardless, let's write the unit test first. That's probably better anyway. Better use of my time. Make sure we've got a unit test so that this doesn't repeatedly break every time. Uh, so, step one. Get my issue number. 1412. And then step two. Write the unit test. Okay, so I believe we've got dialog host tests. Yeah, so let's just collapse all those. I'll add a new one at the bottom here. So STA fact, uh, description, issue 1412, uh, public async task when dialog is not open, content cover grid is not visible. Boom. Okay. And then I think I just steal a little bit of code. Uh, let's see here. Oh, look at that. That grabs my content cover for me too. Great. Uh, let's see here. I think just do a quick assertion and go cert um, false content cover is visible right and then do another test here uh, when dialogue is open content cover is visible. Now I don't know of a great way to um, test that an animation triggered and I'm really not sure that there's a good good reasonable way of doing it because the animations themselves are controlled by the visual state manager which is in turn controlled by the operating system like you can request that a state transition occur but you request it you aren't guaranteed it so I don't I don't know how to write a good test for it uh, let's see here. So show dialog. Ba -ba -ba. So I don't know. Do I not have one of these where I close it? this is what we do. We do something like this. So we do dialogue show something like that uh, and assert true. Uh, let's see content cover is visible and then I'm actually going to steal this and bring it down a little bit. Um, Host. Uh, I believe I can just go current session close. And then we are going to await the 
dialog task, uh, which means I need an async method, async task. So verify that the guy, verify it's shown when it's open, close the dialog, verify it's closed. Makes me feel a little uneasy because I'm technically testing two things in a single unit test, but oh well. It'll work for now. This will at least test this one. It doesn't fix the embedded dialog host yet. Um, but this at least gets us well on our way to to fixing the problem. And I may go back and look at doing um, a simple trigger on that content cover grid rather than having to place it in all of the various visual state managers. It feels like just watching the opacity to zero and toggling hidden when that occurs seems like seems like a cleaner approach so I might go that route but now that we've got unit tests it'll help ensure um, that I don't break anything when I do it first unit test passed go for gold give me both show me both of them working And again, it's, it's a little unusual because I can't actually test the case in question. Okay, so expected true, actual false. Uh, let's see. So the problem being is I almost need await task delay time span from seconds. 0 0.5, all right? Because I'm, I'm somewhat questioning whether, I would have thought that this show would have triggered right away, but that's not really guaranteed because the moment um, it hits that first await, it's gonna return back to me, and if I test that is visible flag right away, it's just gonna work. So this is just to confirm that that is the problem um, I don't think we're actually going to do this. I think what's probably better um, we might just watch the property changes and verify that it goes false to true. I think that's the second failure. This bar up here confuses me. Oh, no, it's still running. Okay. Because if this, if this quote unquote works, then. Nope, expected true, actual false. So this guy is not showing up. So let's let's try a different approach because this is uh, let's see content cover uh, is visible changed right so we're gonna just register up a new handler uh, let's see delegate blah 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 uh, don't care and e We can we can significantly reduce this down. I definitely picked the wrong option there. Uh, and lamb to that. Boom. So let's see. Var values gets new list bool. So we know from the test prior that we can assume that we can start in a false state. So 
what we do is we do values dot add e dot new value uh, direct cast to a bool great and so what we expect to find here dialog task show boom boom uh, da, da, da. think there is an example here where I close it. Thought there was a Yeah, this is basically what I want. Something like this something like this. So down here, uh, let's see here, do we want to await this guy? Show, blah blah blah, I don't care about that. Really I just want something more like this. So when it's opened we're gonna immediately close it. Right? And we can await this Boom. And so, something like that, something like that, and then assert. Uh, equal, right? Because you accept a collection, and I expect to see two items in my collection. I expect to see a true and then a false, and I expect it in my values list. I think this will probably work a little better. I don't know for sure that this is actually enough time. This this gets weird when you both open and show and you're trying to test the visual states of things. Because I am wondering if the fact that this thing uh, is visible is one of those properties. I don't know how well you can reasonably test let's see where are we going here boom expected true false actual zero set so is visible changed exactly zero times? So getting it to go to true seems problematic. Hmm. Let's just look up here. What is my constructor doing? because it's actually what's constructed in this guy. So apply default styles, raise event loaded, so fake it. I'm wondering if this guy actually ever converts over to true. Interesting. Because I don't know... I don't know that the visual state manager is actually going to run at all. So it doesn't exactly shock me that this isn't isn't behaving. Cuz these unit tests are really designed to test the code behind and not the XAML and this is very much a XAML change. I want to leave this out for the moment because I don't think it's providing a lot of value. Um, and I want to come back here. I'm actually going to test it down on the embedded one instead, and just verify that the embedded that it the trigger approach works, because he's got pretty much a very similar layout. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see grid card. Blah blah blah. Content cover grid. 
I believe all we do is this. It's interesting this guy's opacity starts at 1 and the other guy started at 0. kind of feel like that should be changed. While we're in here breaking stuff, let's just keep breaking stuff. Since we're about to test the control, I should be able to change the default pretty easily. Yeah. Because I'd like him to start in a in an off state, basically. So grid style style target type gets grid. I'm not going to worry about a based on because there should be nothing there. Um, style triggers uh, trigger. Property, opacity, when the value goes to zero, setter, property, visibility, set its value to hidden, right? Okay, let's make sure this guy works. And then I think it'll probably be time to call it a night, but at least we'll have one bug fixed and one step closer. It does bother me that I'm not sure entirely how to unit test it. And I'm in the back of my mind, something is telling me that I probably shouldn't try to unit test it. Unit testing the, um, the UI elements like this is usually fraught with peril, um, which is why it's not recommended. This is where UI tests usually come into play. Um, I have this pie in the sky dream about building out UI tests um, on either the demo app directly or something similar to it, just to be able to go through and test various um, bugs like this and just see how it how it works. Um, if anybody wants to take a, a stab at it um, and set up some sort of basic, um, I was thinking like, Appium or any of the other ones. Um, not real picky. Um, I've done a little Selenium, so I have a slight bias in that direction, but um, not opposed to looking at any other options as well. But again, it's one of those things that I, I don't know if you can actually write a test to say, does the, the Visual Studio tool work correctly? I think you really just have to write the test to say, can I Ah, look at that. Animates in, animates out. Can still do this, can still do this. Yeah, I think I like the trigger approach. I'm going to change the other one. This just this seems way much simpler than than all of the visual element stuff. More importantly, seems to work just fine. So I think this will this will solve it. Uh, let's see, part content cover, this guy. Expand, ending tag, paste that style in place. And then let's go back up and whack all of these. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Uh, you're at the end. Next one's at the beginning. And we'll just go and do one last test to make sure everything's still behaving nicely, and then we will commit and push. I'll probably leave a comment and a link to this video showing this. Again, if anyone has better suggestions on how to potentially go about testing this stuff, um, I'm all ears. I have to say, unit testing a theming library is not exactly a common use case. Um, but I know there's a lot of projects that depend on this, and I want to try and keep this as stable as possible. Um, obviously, preview packages may be unstable, and I'm sorry. Um, but the I, I'd like to make the upgrading process hopefully as painless for people as I 
I possibly can. So I am I'm very much appreciative every time I see people um, saying that they were testing out the preview NuGet packages and reporting issues with it. Um, I much prefer to find uh, bugs that way than when I push a release and have a bunch of people jump on top of me and go, ah, things are broken. It's like, I'm sorry. I tried to test it. It's, it's just there's a, there's a big surface area to test and we're only just now getting automated testing going. So, okay. Last pass here. There you go. Get my tools open. And we're going to go down here. Start with the obvious. I can select elements inside. Great, great. That looks great. Pass from the view. That's not right. That one's still there. So somebody still changing it. So let's find. Oh, that guy there will do it. Boom. So if we click the button, I wonder if I just need to relaunch. Sometimes that hot reload stuff doesn't play nice. Um, though I did notice there's a new link on that um, XAML tool with a hot reload thingy on it. I will have to look and see exactly what that does. Uh, I, again, I, I tend to not use the Visual Studio tools. They've been getting better. Um, I've just spent a lot of years with Snoop, and so I'm very or uh, familiar with it, comfortable using it. So that is definitely my my weapon of choice, especially diagnosing some of these UI failures. Um, there is a, sort of a, a little teaser for anybody interested. I'm working on a blog post that hopefully goes out in the next week or so. Um, about a performance problem we ran into on one of the apps that I was working on during my day job. Um, it boiled down to uh, if you have a progress bar with is indeterminate set to true, just because you hide it and set visible um, to collapsed or hidden doesn't mean that uh, that spinning progress bar actually stops and so it ends up um, actually consuming uh, a non- insignificant amount of UI processing power to deal with those. And in my case it got worse because those progress bars were being dumped into a items control that was growing and so you added a bunch and it just kept stacking on top of each other. So the, the simple thing is to actually do a trigger similar to this grid that says hey when, when visible is hidden or collapsed set is indeterminate to false. So that's the, the cheater short way of doing it. That doesn't work in all cases, uh, but at least in my cases it worked great. Okay, so that looked fine. Animates in, animates out, animates in, animates out. Uh, we can still use the tool. Great, 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 great got the custom background color everyone's happy everyone's happy still works okay I think that's looking good well let's actually fix this so where's my git crack so I need a new branch real quick pre branch here fix I think it was 1412 right you think about that for a second. 14.12, good. So let's see, two changes. One in the tests, which I think we revert. Um, is my test still down here? Yeah, I think we revert. This test, knowing that I that is visible never goes to true, um, that other test that's passing feels like uh, false assurance. Uh, I don't like a test that always passes and it's not passing for the reason I think it is. So these ones are just two triggers that are added in each of these grids forcing them hidden. So let's see hiding the content cover when it is not shown. Fix 
fixes issue with VS. What is it? VS live visual tree selector not being able to pick on child elements. Okay. So commit changes. Oh, we should probably. Uh, do, 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 let's see. I'd like to edit this real quick. Fixes fourteen twelve. Update. Great. Thank you. Uh, the little comment. If you put things like um, fixed or fixes, and then the bug number. Um, when the pull request merges, GitHub will automatically uh, close the issue, which is great. It's exactly what we want. So it just makes my life easier. You don't have to have it in the commit message. Um, you can do it in the pull request message as well. That'll take care of it and handle it for you. There we go. Compare and pull request. see here and this is going to be going in the 3.0 release so that matches what we expect matches what we expect great pull request cool so CI system is going to run hopefully this there's no issues all the tests should pass since there's no tests over this area um, and hopefully that's one less thing um, to deal with so um, it is late for me I think I'm going to be signing off it's been two and a half hours I try to stop at two um, I just fail a lot of nights. So um, again, if anybody is interested in Hacktoberfest, I would encourage you to get involved. If you have any problems, questions, um, the idea of contributing to an open source project is intimidating, uh, let me know. Um, I am happy to go through and help anybody out um, and make sure that you can be successful and get stuff done. Uh, again, selfishly, uh, this library and several of my other ones are going to be having issues flagged with Hacktoberfest. So be on the lookout for that label um, and pick up items uh, where you can. Um, and with that, I think I'm going to sign off and say happy coding, everyone. We'll see you all again next week.